Welcome to the material for the third workshop. In this lecture we'll be looking at how to work out peak positions and charge states of ions in mass spectra. In the last lecture we looked at a variety of different spectral measures and features like resolution, resolving power and noise. And now we're going to look at peak positions, thresholds and charge states. In any mass spectrum, one of the key things we're interested in is where the peaks actually are and how high they are. So how do we actually find the mass and intensity of a peak? The process of finding peaks in a mass spectrum is sometimes called peak detection, peak picking or centroiding. And the mathematics of actually finding the peak position and height for every peak is covered in a presentation linked from this button here. This presentation will take you through the process of quadratic interpolation and how you can do that in Excel. In summary though, quadratic interpolation means you find the top three points in any peak, fit a quadratic curve to it, and then use that to identify the actual peak top and peak position, even if it doesn't line up with any of the three points. In the workshop, we'll run through some examples. But for now, look at the two spectra on the screen here. These are from the same data, but in the top view you can see the shape of the peaks, and this is known as the profile spectrum, whereas in the bottom view you can only see the peaks as individual sticks, where the height shows the intensity and the stick shows the position of the peak, and this is called the centroided spectrum, or stick plot. The benefit of the centroided spectrum is that you can see a quick summary of the peak positions in a spectrum. However, the disbenefit is you've lost all the information about the shape of the peaks, any potential shoulders on the sides of the peaks, and you can no longer see the noise, so it's hard to get an idea of the quality of the spectrum. As an expert mass spec user, you'll come to miss that missing data and start to appreciate the extra information that's held in the profile spectrum. I certainly never use centroided spectra unless I've also had a look at the profile spectrum as well. If I superimpose the centroid spectrum over the profile spectrum, we can see what's missing. Not all of the peaks are actually in the centroid spectrum. There are some that are quite clearly visible in the profile spectrum that are missing from the centroid spectrum. So why are these two peaks not included in the centroid spectrum? Quite simply, these two peaks were below a threshold that was set to determine which peak should be included. The peak detection threshold is really important. If you set the threshold too low, then you'll detect every wiggle in the noise and you'll have thousands of false peaks in your peak list or centroid spectrum. But if you set it too high, you start to miss peaks. So optimizing the peak detection threshold intensity is very important. On some mass spectrometry systems, you will have control over where this peak threshold is. But on others, you may not. And if you can only see the centroid of the spectrum, you can't say for sure what peaks are actually missing. So as a quick recap, in a profile mode mass spectrum, you can see the noise and the complete shape of all the peaks in the spectrum. Whereas in the centroid of the spectrum, you can just see the peaks as sticks, with no noise in between them. And in order to generate the centroid of the spectrum, at some point a peak threshold must have been set, and any peaks below that will be missing from the centroid of the spectrum. Looking at this particular example, the next question we might ask is, what's the charge state of this ion? And why is knowing the charge state so important? The reason why the charge state is important is because remember in mass spectrometry, we don't measure the mass of ions directly, we measure the mass to charge ratio. So we need to know the charge in order to work out the actual mass of the ion, which is going to help us identify it. There are several different methods you can use to work out the charge state of an ion. In this example, we're lucky. We can see the isotopic distribution. So the first method is based on that. In an isotopic distribution, the mass spacing between the peaks should be approximately one Dalton. And if the ion is singly charged, they will be. 
But if the ion's doubly charged, that mass spacing between isotopologues will be half a Dalton. If it's triply charged, a third of a Dalton, quadruply charged, a quarter of a Dalton, and so on. So we can estimate the charge state of the ion by dividing the actual mass difference between isotopologue peaks and the measured mass difference between isotopologue peaks. If you're trying to answer this sort of problem in a real mass spectrum or in an exam question, it's always a good idea to measure the charge across multiple isotopic spacings rather than just between one pair of peaks. If the predicted charge doesn't remain constant between multiple isotopologue peaks, then are you sure they're not members of two overlapping isotope distributions? If you are getting a reasonably consistent charge estimation but the precision isn't great, it can be a good idea to take the average charge estimated across multiple pairs of isotope peaks across one distribution. Before leaving this slide, it's worth having another look at this equation. It's actually a lot more general than it might appear. You don't have to use it only on isotope distributions where the peaks are spaced by one Dalton. If you had, for example, a molecule containing chlorines, the major isotopic spacing would be approximately two Daltons, in which case you'd just use two as the delta M actual. You can even have much bigger spacings than that. For example, on protein molecules, you can have multiple glycosylations, so you can have a series of evenly spaced peaks in the spectrum that should differ in mass by 162 Daltons. So in that case, the delta M actual would be 162 Daltons, and the delta M measured would be whatever the spacing is in the actual spectrum. But in any case, it works, no matter how big that regular spacing is, providing you can see it in the spectrum. Obviously, the easiest example is when you can see the complete isotopic distribution and the peaks are only one Dalton apart. Sometimes we can estimate the charge state even more easily. If you can see a large isotopic distribution like this that spans across more than one Dalton, then all you need to do is count the number of peaks in that one Dalton range, and that will give you the charge state. So in this case, there are one, two, three, four, five, six peaks in a one Dalton range, so this has a charge of six. You can even use this technique in the case where you have overlapping isotope distributions, but you have to be careful to count the peaks that belong to only one of the distributions at a time. So here's a problem for you to solve. In this spectrum, there are two charge state distributions, which very slightly overlap in the middle. Can you calculate or estimate what the charge states of these two distributions are? And both of the methods I've just described can successfully be used. If you need it, the peak list on the left can be copied and pasted into Excel to help with calculations. Here I've color coded the distributions to make them easier to see. This problem's even harder because the two distributions overlap even more. But can you still tease them apart and work out what the two charge states are? As before, here I've colored my two estimations of which peaks belong to which distribution. Did you agree with this? You have to use a very different method to work out the charge state of ions when you can't see the isotopic distribution in the spectrum. To explain what I mean, let's have a look at this large peak. So zooming in like this, we can see that there are a series of regularly spaced peaks in this cluster, but it can't be an isotopic distribution because these peaks are six Daltons apart, not one Dalton apart or less. So if this isn't an isotopic distribution, well, what is it? Well, in fact, each one of these individual peaks is the envelope of an isotopic distribution and the different peaks correspond to compounds that have different masses. Just in this case, there is a regular mass difference between them, perhaps implying a regular addition of some adduct onto a larger molecule. Now, in order to work out what these adducts might be, we need to know their mass. And in order to know the mass, we need to know the charge state that these ions are in. So let's zoom back out and find out how we calculate that. Now we've zoomed back out again, we can have a look at the detail of the wider set of peaks. Now although it might look like these peaks are evenly spaced, actually they're not. 
The mass spacing between clusters at this high mass end is 211, and down at this end it's only 170. So as we get to lower mass, the spacing between the peak clusters gets less and less. And that's because these peaks are actually the result of viewing the same set of ions at ever-increasing charge states. And it's because we can see these same ions at different charge states that we can work out what those charge states are. So let's have a look at how we do that. This is the same spectrum that was shown on the previous slide. I've just moved it up here so we've got room for the calculations underneath. You can see that I've labelled three of the peak clusters A, B and C. Let's consider the peaks in cluster A first. Remember cluster A is a series of peaks at a single charge state. Let's just consider one of those peaks. Now that appears at an apparent mass A which corresponds to its actual mass divided by its charge state. And now if we consider the corresponding ion in cluster B, that ion has the same mass but it's now showing a charge state one higher than it was before. Now we can rearrange both of these equations to solve for n. And then it's another simple rearrangement to this function here, where we can see that the ratio of the mass to charge values for the ions at A and B equals 1 plus the reciprocal of the charge state for ion A. And so if we knew the mass to charge ratios for A and B, we could quickly calculate what Z must be. It's always a good idea to repeat the calculation for a different pair of peaks in order to confirm that your initial charge state estimate was accurate. So let's repeat the process, but instead of using peak clusters A and B, we'll use A and C, and then we can repeat the same derivation again. The difference now, of course, being that the charge state of C should be two higher than A. If we now go through the same process of solving for M and then rearranging as we did in the last example, we get a very slightly different final equation. However, if you solve this for Z, you should get the same Z value as you got when you were looking at peaks clusters A and B. If you don't, then either something's gone wrong in your calculation, or they're not members of the same charge state distribution. So, if I give you this set of mass to charge values, can you calculate the charge state for the ion in the most abundant cluster in the distribution? I've also made an HTML5 version of this video. The benefit of watching the presentation in HTML5 mode is that you get to go through it at your own pace and answer questions and problems as you go along to help you understand the material. To find the HTML5 versions, go to the Kilgour Lab website at www.kilgourlab.com and then go to the Teaching Resources page. On there you'll find a whole variety of resources to help you learn about mass spectrometry. I hope you enjoy them. So that brings us to the end of this session. In this material we've discussed peak centroiding, thresholding and how to determine charge states of ions in mass spectra.